Hi, and welcome to our video on nervous systems. If you haven't watched our previous video on the structure and function of neurons, you probably should before you watch this video, because this video is going to take that and show how we arrange these nerves into the thing that we recognize as our animal nervous system. And really, all that is, even if it's something like this brain in a jar, this one happened to belong to a chimpanzee apparently, are just collections of neurons that are all put together so that they can interact with each other. That's what a nervous system is, and that's what we'll be talking about in this video. The question that we'll be answering is, how do animals coordinate their communication? In this video, we'll be talking about evolutionary trends in nervous systems, and we'll talk a little bit about brain structure and function in a very broad sense. Let's start with evolutionary trends in nervous systems. Here are a bunch of animals with their nervous systems all shown. And we can see that even something so comparatively simple as a cnidarian like a hydra has a nervous system. It's a very primitive nervous system, what's called a neural net. The neurons are distributed throughout the entirety of the organism. There's no centralized nervous system, no central processing unit. What we see in all of the other organisms in this diagram is a trend towards centralization of the nervous system. Every one of these other organisms has some version of a central nervous system, a way in which the neurons all feed into a central processing region, though not all of them have structures that we would generally consider to be brains. The other trend that we see moving beyond our friend the echinoderm is a trend towards a cephalization or concentration of the sensory organs and the main part of the central nervous system, the brain, within a body region of the organism that we'll call the head. That's what cephalization means. It's literally the headification of animals. The advantages of centralization and cephalization are probably clear to you, but let's pause and talk about them anyway. What's happening when we centralize and cephalize our nervous systems is we're increasing the amount of coordination and control that our nervous systems can play in integrating incoming sensation and then generating responses as a result. We're gonna focus for the rest of this video on vertebrate nervous systems and how they're arranged. Generally, we like to structure this in two major divisions, our central nervous system and our peripheral nervous system. The Peripheral nervous system is where our sensory receptors live. These are sensory organs that have sensory neurons attached to them. They can be things like the various receptors in our skin. They can be our eyes or our ears. In all cases, no matter what the particulars of the sensory receptors are, these receptors will take in information and turn it into action potentials that are then sent to our central nervous system. The brain and spinal cord. The function of the central nervous system is integrating that incoming sensory information and coordinating a response as a result. Information that comes in will be transferred to neurons who send that information back out to other divisions of our peripheral nervous system that carry out responses. These are things like our motor neurons or other parts of our body that can carry out actions in response to incoming information from our central nervous systems, our brain. Nervous systems always work this way in vertebrates. The information goes from sensory neurons to the interneurons that we find in our central nervous system and then back out to our motor neurons and other divisions of our responding peripheral nervous system once again. We can further divide the vertebrate nervous system into a series of different divisions. So the central nervous system in this diagram is shown on the top. And then we have our peripheral nervous system, which is broken out into a sensory division and a motor division. And that is in turn broken down further into an autonomic nervous system, which comprises a sympathetic division and a parasympathetic division, and then our somatic nervous system. It's all very cool and all very interesting, but I only want to make one point. Here is the division that you have any conscious control over. It's simply our somatic nervous system. All of the rest of our nervous system is functioning outside of our conscious control through the action of our unconscious brain. That's a pretty cool thing, and it's also relieving because you don't need to worry about things like dilating your blood vessels or making sure that your peristaltic motion in your digestive system happens. That's all happening in your brain without you having to think about it. I think that's relieving, but I can totally see how you might think that that's kind of freaky 
two, we're gonna leave that aside. And let's go in and look at the brain itself and how the brain functions. In order to understand how brains function, we should talk a little bit about how they're structured first. Brains are fundamentally broken up into two major types of tissue. We have white matter and gray matter. The white matter is entirely neural axons, and the gray matter are the synapses between dendrites and nerve terminals of those neurons. All of the folds of the brain are simply a surface area adaptation that enables us to cram more neurons into the space in our skulls. The more neurons we have, the wider a variety of sensation and responses we can have as a result. And this diagram is showing us a fluorescence image of a region of the cortex, the gray matter on the surface of our brains. And you can see the individual neurons all clustered together, making the various synaptic connections that is universal among neurons. The brain is an incredibly complex organ, but that complexity doesn't really come from the structure of white matter and gray matter so much as it comes from all of the connections between the neurons that comprise it. Brains are networks of neurons, and neurons are biochemical electrical signaling cells. So another way of thinking about a brain is that it is an electrical cellular network. And we can see this in things like electroencephalograms, where we get patterns of electrical signals from the brain. Recently, we've been able to tease out more of how these electrical interactions are working in our brains through things like functional MRI, where we can put people into MRI machines and actually see the changes in circulation patterns that are happening in their brains in real time as their brains are thinking about things. This work in functional MRIs continues to advance, but you can see in this graphic that the regions of the brain that are activated in response to being shown a face are very different than the regions of the brain that are activated in response to being shown a house. As more and more of this information is gathered, it can be used to generate an increasingly complex picture of how those electrical signals work to generate thought in our brains. This is data from an experiment where individuals were shown different patterns, either contrast patterns or the actual words N-E-U-R-O-N -E that you can see up at the top of the diagram. The electrical activity of their brains was then visualized and it was visualized in such a way that the patterns of nervous signaling in their brains that were generated could then be reconstructed by computers and used to independently generate the same pattern that the individuals were presented with to begin with. In other words, the computers enabled the scientists to literally read the thoughts of the individuals in this study. Another major domain of this research involves work in the development of so-called brain-computer interfaces. This image is showing a monkey who is actually controlling a robotic arm using his brain. The sensors that are hooked up to his brain as he thinks about using the arm are being interpreted by a computer and used to then move the arm in the way that the monkey is thinking about it. That's kind of cool and kind of scary, but I'm sure that you can see the applications that these kinds of brain-computer interfaces will have for people who are suffering from paralysis or from other inabilities to move their bodies. It's incredibly powerful work, and all of this together demonstrates that brains work through the generation of electrical signals in the neurons that make them up. That may sound relatively simple, but it's the patterns of these electrical signals that lead to the complexity of responses that we see in animals that have brains. Now that we have some understanding of how brains work, let's talk about major regions of the human brain. We're only gonna look at big regions here. We're not gonna get into the individual folds of the brain. That's more for your anatomy classes in college. But we'll start at the bottom of the brain with the medulla. The medulla is a region of the brain responsible for many of the involuntary unconscious functions that keep us alive. Things like breathing and peristalsis are controlled at the level of the medulla. It's relatively basic stuff, but it's incredibly important. The cerebellum is this region here, above the medulla and below all of the folds of the brain, and the cerebellum is really where a lot of other information is integrated for things that require coordination and control. Things like balance and your understanding of your position in space are largely integrated in the cerebellum. The largest region of our brains is the cerebrum, and this is where almost everything that makes us quote-unquote human happens. Things like emotion and thought and memory and sensation. A lot of this is happening in the different regions of the cerebrum, and we'll look at a couple of examples in a little bit. But our cerebrums as humans are more developed than many of the cerebrums that we see in other animals, though certainly there are lineages that have 
very highly developed cerebrums as well. Other great apes and cetaceans like dolphins have incredibly well-developed cerebrums as well. Certainly the brain is also the seat of endocrine control. We've talked about that previously, but the pituitary and the hypothalamus, which are found in the center of our brains, are the so-called master glands for controlling endocrine responses throughout our bodies. Looking at the brain in another way, we generally break the brain up into two separate hemispheres, though they do connect to each other through a structure called the corpus callosum that enables one hemisphere to talk to the other. But the two hemispheres are responsible for different types of functions. This is showing us the left hemisphere of our cerebrum, sort of as if we were staring at it, and we can see that different regions of the cerebrum have different functions. But to focus on just one of those, we can see the different regions of the brain that are associated with our motor functions, or the control of the different regions of our body. In this color-coded map, the part of our brain that controls our fingers, for instance, is represented here in red. And the other areas of our body are represented in the other colors that you see. We could just as easily do this for our sensory cortex and we would see the same kind of regionality. Different areas of our brain are responsible for different things. The brain is an incredibly complex organ and we're not doing it justice here, but we're getting the kind of understanding that we need in order to get a handle on how the experience of being an animal, sensing the world around us and responding in very, very quick order is accomplished through the structure of our nervous system in general and our brain specifically. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of nervous systems. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can describe the major evolutionary trends that we see in the nervous systems of animals. Make sure that you can explain how the divisions of the vertebrate nervous system, the peripheral and central nervous system divisions, work together to sense, integrate, and respond to stimuli. And finally, make sure that you can identify the major regions of the brain associated with particular types of nervous system functioning, limited to things like the medulla, the cerebellum, the cerebrum, and some limited understanding of how different regions of the brain play a role in different functions in our bodies. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.